Hello everyone, I'm Victor, and I'm here to try to present you some interesting concepts about pure maths. And well, I know math can be frightening, and I know you may think it's impossible to learn these things anyway, and well, before you close this video and pretend that it never happened, I want to say to you that this is an introductory work, in which I'll try to show you that even abstract and potentially very complex subjects can be seen in some way as very simple intuitive ideas. So, the goal of this video is to present you a theory, a fact, about geometric group theory. And, well, what is geometric group theory? I could say it's a theory that treats groups in a geometric way, but <laughs> that's not an explanation. So, let's do it differently. So, okay, I'll start a bit abstract, but don't worry. Uh, to be honest, the most important thing are the drawings. But anyway, let's start talking about category theory. And well, why category theory? Because groups are category, topology is a category, and well, you may not even know what group and topology are, but it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter right now. But well, what is a category? It's basically composed of two things. First one is a class of objects. And what are objects? Well, they're basically a thing. They can be numbers, sets, or well, <laughs> anything you want. The second one is usually called a class of morphisms, or well, as I prefer, a class of arrows. What arrows do? They link things, they link objects. There are some rules to these arrows to not let things go too crazy, but this is the essence. There are a lot of different types of categories with uh, different objects and different morphisms, but they have this common structure with some objects and some arrows. And there are also functors, which are maps or arrows that link one category to another category. This can be very interesting, because sometimes you can have a problem in one category that is very difficult to solve, and when you move it to another category, it becomes clearer. Also, you can discover some aspects of an object of a category that weren't clear before. A branch of mathematics that studies some types of functors is algebraic topology, which is basically a very close and maybe more popular and cool relative to our geometric group theory. What people usually do when they are doing algebraic topology is to study some problems that exist in the category of topology with uh, tools from abstract algebra. What we are going to do is basically the opposite. We're going to consider groups, which are algebraic structures, and study them as topological or geometrical things. Groups. Groups are sets with an operation that follow three simple rules. But, well, this may not mean a lot to you. The important thing to know about the definition of groups is that they are a collection of things that can be put together to form other things that are also in the group. And also, which is made the most important thing, Groups possess, in some sense, a symmetric structure. That is, they have a neutral element, and every single element has an opposite correspondent, as a reflection. The classical example is the integers, that are the numbers that you already know. They are 0, 1, minus 1, 2, minus 2, 3, minus 3, and so on. In resume, the integers are all possible values that one can form by summing 1 and minus 1 an arbitrary number of times. 0 is 1 plus minus 1. 4 is 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, minus 4 is minus 1 plus minus 1 plus minus 1 plus minus 1, and so on. The only thing we need to know, then, to write any integer to define it, this whole group is what is 1, what is minus 1, and how to sum. Then, we can say that this group is generated by this set of 1 and minus 1. As this set is finite, or, more precisely, as we can find a finite generating set to this group, one can call this group a finitely generated group. It's about these groups, finitely generated groups, that we'll talk about the rest of the video. And well, I can understand these definitions may sound kind of arbitrary and abstract, but for now on, it will be mostly about drawings. I swear! So let's draw this group. <laughs> they may be the only group we know, but anyway. A very natural way to do this would be to put a point to every element of our set and to link them with the operations induced by our generating set. That is, link every element to the ones we can find by adding 1 or minus 1. These drawings, I recall, 
telegraphs of a group. We'll see some more examples in a bit, but for now, it's very interesting to see that geometrical nature of this figure. And, well, what do I mean by this? Basically, considering the telegraph, we can talk about the neighborhood of a point, the distance between two points, the size and shape of any subset I want. And, because of this, we can talk about properties that didn't make sense to the group when we analyzed it before from a pure algebraic point of view. And that's exactly what we will do, by studying the number of ends of a group, which is a very classical thing to do in geometric group theory. Ends. Intuitively, ends are the number of ways in which we can go to infinity without leaving the graph. What does it mean? Uh, well, imagine I paint one vertex of the graph. It corresponds to an element of the group. I would still have two disconnected white things that are not painted. If I now paint the edges and vertexes that are immediate neighbors to this first point, I still have two disconnected new painted subgraphs. And if I painted all the vertices and edges that are neighbors to something that I already painted, I still have two disconnected, not painted things. And it doesn't matter how many times I do this process, I'll still have two disconnected things. So I'll say I have two ends. This graph has two ends. And this group has two ends. There's a little disclaimer to do. We presented Cayley graphs of a group as regarding its generating set. But as long as they are finite, in terms of number of ends, the generating set doesn't really matter. I'm not gonna prove it uh, right here, uh, and it's a bit technical to show rigorously that it's true, but it's a nice thing to think about. And well, you can always read my article if you will. Let's dive in some other examples then. Starting by z2, which is basically the integers and the integers again. An element of z2 is a pair of two elements of z, which is the integers. Its scaly graph is like we show in the screen. Yeah, it's easy to see that repeating the same process that we did last time will always result in one non painted connected element, so we'll have one edge. Another example are finite groups, like this that will appear on the screen. They come from a construction that we call modular arithmetic, and for a number n, we call them z mod n. One can think of them as the first n natural numbers. The group structure is given by the unitary sum with the special rule of the last element plus one equalizing the first. This provides the cyclical nature of the Cayley graphs. We can see on the screen, respectively, the ones corresponding to z mod 3, z mod 5, and z mod 7. It's not hard to see that finite groups have zero ends, as when we start painting, we suddenly paint it all. The last group I want to introduce you is a bit different from the others. As its elements are not usually understood as numbers or pairs of numbers or anything like that, but words. And what do I want to say by words? Well, imagine a very simple alphabet with A and B. And, well, we are talking about a group, so we must have symmetry. Then we must consider minus A and minus B. This group is usually called free group. And it is the collection of all possible words, considering the word that is no word at all, the empty word, and adding some number of A, B, minus A, and minus B. Our generating set is, then, the four possible letters, and the operation of this group is the act of adding a letter in the word. And how it draws? Well, we start from the empty word and start adding letters after this, as in the image. The result will be this very cool graph with a fractal nature. And what's the number of ends? Well, you can see, as we start our process of painting, the number of non-painted disjointed things will just go up and up and up and up. Then, we'll say this group have an infinite amount of ends. Now, it's very natural to you to wonder what other groups exist. How can I draw them? How many ends do they have? And I can assure you, there are a lot of things out there. If you can think about a finite generating set and an operation, you can construct a group. A finitely generated group. You can then draw their Cayley graph as we did and calculate the number of ends. But I can assure you, and this is surprising, maybe the highest point of the video, the final result won't be new. I showed you all the possible examples of number of ends. It's crazy, doesn't it? We have our theorem.
and I can state it right now and you understand. Every finitely generated group has 0, 1, 2 or infinitely many ends. This is not trivial, this sounds arbitrary, but it is what it is. There is no finitely generated group with exactly 3 ends or 4 ends or whatever. Well, to show rigorously why it is not trivial, but you can always try to read my paper in which I prove this. And well, I guess that was it. Uh, the goal of the video was to introduce you to this whole world of permaths and to show that even though some concepts might be very abstract, there can be ways of thinking about it that are easier. And well, you shouldn't fear math. A theorem like this, with some terms that uh, don't seem to make out of sense at first sight, it's at the core about painting some drawings, <laughs> as kids do. I guess that was it. Thank you very much for your time and see you the next. Bye bye!